Section seventeen of Jane Austen's Juvenilia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Lady Susan. Part five. Letter twenty seven. Mrs. Vernon to Lady de Courcy. Churchill. This letter, my dear mother, will be brought to you by Reginald. His long visit is about to be concluded at last, but I fear the separation takes place too late to do us any good. She is going to town, to see her particular friend, Mrs. Johnson. It was at first her intention that Frederica should accompany her for the benefit of masters, but we overruled her there. Frederica was wretched in the idea of going, and I could not bear to have her at the mercy of her mother. Not all the masters in London could compensate for the ruin of her comfort. I should have feared, too, for her health, and for everything in short but her principles. There, I believe, she is not to be injured, even by her mother, or all her mother's friends. But with those friends, a very bad set, I doubt not, she must have mixed, or have been left in total solitude, and I can hardly tell which would have been worse for her. If she is with her mother, moreover, she must, alas, in all probability be with Reginald, and that would be the greatest evil of all. Here we shall in time be at peace. Our regular employments, our books and conversation, with exercise, the children, and every domestic pleasure in my power to procure her, will, I trust, gradually overcome this youthful attachment. I should not have a doubt of it, were she slighted for any other woman in the world than her own mother. How long Lady Susan will be in town, or whether she returns here again, I know not. I could not be cordial in my invitation, but if she chooses to come, no want of cordiality on my part will keep her away. I could not help asking Reginald if he intends being in town this winter, as soon as I found that her ladyship's steps would be bent thither, and though he professed himself quite undetermined, there was a something in his look and voice as he spoke which contradicted his words. I have done with lamentation. I look upon the event as so far decided that I resign myself to it in despair. If he leaves you soon for London, everything will be concluded. Yours affectionately, Catherine Vernon. Letter twenty eight. Mrs. Johnson to Lady Susan, Edward Street. My dearest friend, I write in the greatest distress. The most unfortunate event has just taken place. Mr. Johnson has hit on the most effectual manner of plaguing us all. He had heard, I imagine, by some means or other, that you were soon to be in London, and immediately contrived to have such an attack of the gout as must at least delay his journey to Bath, if not wholly prevent it. I am persuaded the gout is brought on or kept off at pleasure. It was the same when I wanted to join the Hamiltons to the Lakes, and three years ago, when I had a fancy for Bath, nothing could induce him to have a gouty symptom. I have received yours, and have engaged the lodgings in consequence. I am pleased to find that my letter had so much effect on you, and that de Courcy is certainly your own. Let me hear from you as soon as you arrive, and in particular tell me what you mean to do with Mainwaring. It is impossible to say when I shall be able to see you. My confinement must be great. It is such an abominable trick to be ill here instead of at Bath, that I can scarcely command myself at all. At Bath his old aunts would have nursed him, but here it all falls upon me, and he bears pain with such patience that I have not the common excuse for losing my temper. Yours ever, Alicia. Letter twenty nine. Lady Susan to Mrs. Johnson. Upper Seymour Street. My dear Alicia, there needed not this last fit of the gout to make me detest Mr. Johnson, but now the extent of my aversion is not to be estimated. To have you confined a nurse in his apartment! My dear Alicia, of what a mistake were you guilty in marrying a man of his age? Just old enough to be formal, ungovernable, and to have the gout, too old to be agreeable, and too young to die. I arrived last night about five, and had scarcely swallowed my dinner when Mainwaring made his appearance. I will not dissemble what real pleasure his sight afforded me, nor how strongly I felt the contrast between his person and manners and those of Reginald, to the infinite disadvantage of the latter. 
For an hour or two I was even staggered in my resolution of marrying him, and though this was too idle and nonsensical an idea to remain long on my mind, I do not feel very eager for the conclusion of my marriage, or look forward with much impatience to the time when Reginald, according to our agreement, is to be in town. I shall probably put off his arrival, under some pretence or other. He must not come till Mainwaring is gone. I am still doubtful at times as to marriage. If the old man would die I might not hesitate, but a state of dependence on the caprice of Sir Reginald will not suit the freedom of my spirit, and if I resolve to wait for that event I shall have excuse enough at present in having been scarcely ten months a widow. I have not given Mainwaring any hint of my intention, or allowed him to consider my acquaintance with Reginald as more than the commonest flirtation, and he is tolerably appeased. Adieu till we meet. I am enchanted with my lodgings. Yours ever, S. Vernon. Letter thirty. Lady Susan to Mr. de Courcy, Upper Seymour Street. I have received your letter, and though I do not attempt to conceal that I am gratified by your impatience for the hour of meeting, I yet feel myself under the necessity of delaying that hour beyond the time originally fixed. Do not think me unkind for such an exercise of my power, or accuse me of instability without first hearing my reasons. In the course of my journey from Churchill, I had ample leisure for reflection on the present state of our affairs, and every review has served to convince me that they require a delicacy and cautiousness of conduct, to which we have hitherto been too little attentive. We have been hurried on by our feelings to a degree of precipitance which ill accords with the claims of our friends or the opinion of the world. We have been unguarded in forming this hasty engagement, but we must not complete the imprudence by ratifying it, while there is so much reason to fear the connection would be opposed by those friends on whom you depend. It is not for us to blame any expectation on your father's side of your marrying to advantage. Where possessions are so extensive as those of your family, the wish of increasing them, if not strictly reasonable, is too common to excite surprise or resentment. He has a right to acquire a woman of fortune in his daughter-in-law, and I am sometimes quarrelling with myself for suffering you to form a connection so imprudent. But the influence of reason is often acknowledged too late by those who feel like me. I have now been but a few months a widow and however little indebted to my husband's memory for any happiness derived from him during an union of some years, I cannot forget that the indelicacy of so early a second marriage must subject me to the censure of the world, and incur what would be still more insupportable, the displeasure of Mr. Vernon. I might perhaps harden myself in time against the injustice of general reproach, but the loss of his valued esteem, I am, as you well know, ill-fitted to endure and when to this may be added the consciousness of having injured you with your family, how am I to support myself? With feelings so poignant as mine, the conviction of having divided the son from his parents would make me, even with you, the most miserable of beings. It will surely, therefore, be advisable to delay our union, to delay it till appearances are more promising, till affairs have taken a more favourable turn. To assist us in such a resolution, I feel that absence will be necessary. We must not meet. Cruel as this sentence may appear, the necessity of pronouncing it, which can alone reconcile it to myself, will be evident to you when you have considered our situation in the light in which I have found myself imperiously obliged to place it. You may be, you must be well assured that nothing but the strongest conviction of duty could induce me to wound my own feelings by urging a lengthened separation and of insensibility to yours you will hardly suspect me. Again, therefore, I say that we ought not, we must not yet meet. By a removal for some months from each other, we shall tranquillise the sisterly fears of Mrs. Vernon, who, accustomed herself to the enjoyment of riches, considers fortune as necessary everywhere, and whose sensibilities are not of a nature to comprehend ours. Let me hear from you soon, very soon. Tell me that you submit to my arguments and do not reproach me for using such. I cannot bear reproaches. My spirits are not so high as to need being repressed. I must endeavour to seek amusement abroad, and fortunately many of my friends are in town. 
Among them, the Mainwarings. You know how sincerely I regard both husband and wife. I am ever faithfully yours, S. Vernon. Letter thirty one. Lady Susan to Mrs. Johnson, Upper Seymour Street. My dear friend, that tormenting creature Reginald is here. My letter, which was intended to keep him longer in the country, has hastened him to town. Much as I wish him away, however, I cannot help being pleased with such a proof of attachment. He is devoted to me, heart and soul. He will carry this note himself, which is to serve as an introduction to you, with whom he longs to be acquainted. Allow him to spend the evening with you, that I may be in no danger of his returning here. I have told him that I am not quite well, and must be alone, and should he call again there might be confusion, for it is impossible to be sure of servants. Keep him, therefore, I entreat you, in Edward Street. You will not find him a heavy companion, and I allow you to flirt with him as much as you like. At the same time do not forget my real interest. Say all that you can to convince him that I shall be quite wretched if he remain here. You know my reasons, propriety, and so forth. I would urge them more myself, but that I am impatient to be rid of him, as Mainwaring comes within half an hour. Adieu. S. V. Letter thirty two. Mrs. Johnson to Lady Susan, Edward Street. Oh, my dear creature, I am in agonies, and know not what to do, nor what you can do. Mr. de Courcy arrived just when he should not. Mrs. Mainwaring had that instant entered the house, and forced herself into her guardian's presence, though I did not know a syllable of it till afterwards, for I was out when both she and Reginald came, or I would have sent him away at all events. But she was shut up with Mr. Johnson, while he waited in the drawing-room for me. She arrived yesterday in pursuit of her husband, but perhaps you know this already from himself. She came to this house to entreat my husband's interference, and before I could be aware of it, everything that you could wish to be concealed was known to him, and unluckily she had wormed out of Mainwaring's servant that he had visited you every day since your being in town, and had just watched him to your door herself. What could I do? Facts are such horrid things. All is by this time known to de Courcy, who is now alone with Mr. Johnson. Do not accuse me. Indeed it was impossible to prevent it. Mr. Johnson has for some time suspected de Courcy of intending to marry you, and would speak with him alone, as soon as he knew him to be in the house. That detestable Mrs. Mainwaring, who for your comfort has spreaded herself thinner and uglier than ever, is still here, and they have all been closeted together. What can be done? If Mainwaring is now with you, he had better be gone. At any rate, I hope he will plague his wife more than ever. With anxious wishes, yours faithfully, Alicia. Letter thirty three. Lady Susan to Mrs. Johnson, Upper Seymour Street. This eclaircissement is rather provoking. How unlucky that you should have been from home! I thought myself sure of you at seven. I am undismayed, however. Do not torment yourself with fears on my account. Depend upon it, I can make my own story good with Reginald. Mainwaring is just gone. He brought me the news of his wife's arrival. Silly woman! What does she expect by such manoeuvres? Yet I wish she had stayed quietly at Langford. Reginald will be a little enraged at first, but by to-morrow's dinner everything will be well again. Adieu. S. V. Letter thirty four. Mr. de Courcy to Lady Susan. Hotel. I write only to bid you farewell. The spell is removed. I see you as you are. Since we parted yesterday I have received from indisputable authority such an history of you as must bring the most mortifying conviction of the imposition I have been under, and the absolute necessity of an immediate and eternal separation from you. You cannot doubt to what I allude. Langford! Langford! That word will be sufficient. I received my information in Mr. Johnson's house, from Mrs. Mainwaring herself. You know how I have loved you. You can intimately judge of my present feelings. But I am not so weak as to find indulgence in describing them to a woman who will glory in having excited their anguish, but whose affection they have never been able to gain. Ah, de Courcy. End of section 17